Good morning. How's my New Year's family this morning? Blessed. Blessed. Amen. And let's thank the band for what they do. Golly, thank you. We appreciate y'all guys. All that good music. You know, I was talking to Keith back here, telling him how blessed he really was. Uh, I went one time to visit the Hubbard Cowboy Church down in Hubbard, uh, and their baptisms are a little bit different. They have a pond out back. And when I was down there, it was in December. And this one gentleman, he wanted to get baptized. And I know you're not supposed to talk people out of baptism, but that pastor, he was trying because <laughs> he knew he was going to crawl off in that water with that guy. And it was cold. So we're blessed. We got hot water. Amen. Doesn't it seem like time flies by? I mean, Christmas just, it's coming, it's already gone, and we're already into the second day of the new year. I mean, time flies. I think as you get older, it flies faster because kids don't think it goes fast enough when it comes time for Christmas. And many of you probably celebrated this uh, coming new year in many different ways or traditions. Many, many of you may have a tradition you do at uh, Thanksgiving, I mean at uh, uh, New Year's. Uh, that you've always done. I know my brother does. It's something about getting in their swimming pool. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. So I guess that's a way of baptism there. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, they, uh, many people have different traditions. Many ways they celebrate. And there's many people that also find themselves making New Year's resolutions. And some kind of that they think may be something they need to improve. Or changing their lives. And, you know, we hear about New Year's resolutions every year. The problem with New Year's resolutions is they're, they're made on New Year's Day and they're broken on New Year's Day. You know, that, that's the thing. It, it doesn't last very long. You really have to, you really want to have to stay committed to that resolution if you're going to do it. And I'm going to give you a little history lesson here. Did you know that the tradition of New Year's resolutions started from the Babylonians who resolved to return borrowed farming equipment? Each year. That was their resolution every year to return uh, farming equipment. In 2000 BC, the Babylonians celebrated the new year during a 12 day festival called Anatu. This was the start of the farming season to plant crops, crown their king, and make promises to pay their debts. One common resolution was the returning of borrowed farm equipment since this was an agricultural based society. Many of you probably didn't know that. I didn't know that until I read all this. And I read this in the, uh, help me out, Farmer's Almanac. Farmer's Almanac. Yeah, they had a lot of information in here. It said the Babylonian New Year was adopted by the ancient Romans, as was the tradition of resolutions. The timing, though, eventually shifted, <clears throat> though, with the Julian calendar in 46 B.C. So they, they actually changed the date of it, which declared January 1st, as the start of the new year each time. And this kind of fit since it was a farming community and, uh, you know, all the celebrations and all that stuff has passed, so it's kind of how to start the new year. And January was named for the two-faced Roman god Janus, who looks forward for new beginnings and backwards for reflection and resolution. The Romans actually would offer sacrifices to Janus and make promises of good behavior for the year ahead. Janus being the guardian of the gates and doors meant that he also presided over the temple of peace where the doors were open only during wartime. It was known as a place of safety where new beginnings and new resolutions could be forged. How many of you made a New Year's resolution this year? Anybody in here? You don't, don't have to be ashamed to raise your hand if you got something you wanted to, uh, to uh, change in your life or something that uh, you thought needed some work on. Maybe a resolution to lose weight. That's the number one. Did you know that? The number one resolution every year is for a person to lose weight. Maybe it was just to stay fit, healthy. With all the stuff going on in our world, that would be a good resolution to try and stay fit. You know, what we've been going through over the last couple of years. Here's a good one. A son called his parents to wish them a happy new year. And when his dad answered the phone, he asked his dad, Well, dad, what's your new year's resolution? His dad replied, To make your mother as happy as I can all year long. When his mom got on the phone, he asked her the same question. 
His mom replied that her resolution was to see that her dad keeps his dad keeps his New Year's resolution. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. Amen. <laughs> New Year's resolutions to make changes to ourselves or things in our lives is always a good thing. It's always a good thing to make that commitment. No matter how great we believe our life is, there's always room for improvement. Always. The problem with any kind of resolution we make is we never will reach that resolution or complete it without total commitment. We must be sincere and committed to any kind of resolution we choose to make for us to be able to reach that goal of that resolution or commitment that we have in our lives. So once again, just like Buster spoke of here earlier, it's a commitment. You, you've really got to be committed to that drive to reach those goals. And a resolution to change something could be viewed as a temporary thing. But it should be viewed as a permanent thing in our lives, not temporary. It, and it appears to me from people that I've visited with that people actually seek to change. And, and the new year gives them a fresh start. They look at it, well, this is the new year. I have a fresh start right now beginning in the new year. To change these things. But the problem is, is even though they actually seek to change and, and they, they truly want to, they're not willing to commit or work at making that change. Not really go all in, you know, to make the change. And that kind of keeps us on the fence a little bit, dude. You know, you, all it takes is a little push in the wrong direction and, you, you know, you're done. You know, lay some, you know, you, you say you're going to lose weight, but you lay all that food in front of you on <laughs> On, on New Year's Day, hey, you know, football, chips, hamburgers, uh, that's, that's kind of hard, isn't it? There's really only one permanent change or fresh start available, and that would be the change or fresh start of forgiveness that comes from our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where we start. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, we're going to start right there this morning. Here's a great New Year's resolution. I make a resolution to bring my Bible with me every time I come to church this year. Amen? So you can read it right along with me. I, like I say, don't take my word for it. Let's take God's word for it. Amen? So we're in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. And Paul speaking right here. It says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Look at those first words. Forgetting those things which are behind. That's our biggest issue. Forgetting the things that are behind. The bad, the failures, the hurts, the disappointments, sins, and so many other things we carry around with us that we brought from last year into this year. Right now is the time to leave them behind you. Don't carry them with you. That's what God's basically asking us to do, and that's what Paul's saying here. I'm not going to worry about that stuff. I'm going to leave it behind me, and I'm going to strive toward what's in front of me. And that's where we all should be, forgetting the things behind. I'll say this today. If we significantly want to change our lives, then I should, would suggest to you that we commit ourselves to four changes. Four changes that are very needed in our lives that will make our lives better for the new year. Four simple changes that we could change it, how our new year is going to be. These following commitments will make us, make, make us have a radical difference in our lives. A radical change in our lives for the better for this next year. If you're willing to make those commitments. These four commitments... In these four commitments, God encourages us to make, could be the most significant life-changing events in your lives. Four little commitments could be so significant in our lives that it would change everything for the following year. The first one, commit ourselves to forget our failures. Verse 13, remember what verse 13 said, forget what is behind. So, 
commit ourselves to forget about all the failures. Because we've all had failures throughout the year in one way or another. We may have just failed our spouse. We may have failed our kids. We may have failed at work. We may have failed God. But leave it behind us. Ask for forgiveness and move on. We don't have to live our lives imprisoned by our past. Amen? Because that's sometimes what we do. Is we find ourselves imprisoned by these things that happened in our past and we can't let them go and they just keep us drugged down. We might not see our failures recorded in history, but they can be recorded in our hearts and minds. Amen? And that's a problem. That's where our change needs to be made. Many of us know we have failed ourselves in some way this year, I'm sure. And it can be painful when you do that, you know. To me, if you don't fail, you're not trying. Ask my wife. I fail a lot. I do. I fail at things. But you know what? I let it go and move on to the next thing. And that's the way life should be. And to be honest, we've failed God at some point during this past year. Each and every one of us. I I can say this. I don't believe there's one person in here that hasn't failed God at some point this year. In some way. Because we are not sinless. Amen? Amen? But what God's word is telling us that we must allow ourselves not to be bogged down by our past failures. Don't let it drag you down. It tells us that we should not dwell on the past so much that it stops us from moving forward. And looking at what the future holds for us. Because we tend to do that from time to time. The second thing we need to do is commit ourselves to give up grudges. Everybody know what a grudge is? Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. Colossians chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. God's word right here is challenging us directly and personally to give up grudges. Because many people... Hold on to grudges. Don't think that I'm not, I'm not exempt from that. You know, I have, I have little demons that pop up every once in a while, and I have to find myself giving that person forgiveness. Uh, sometimes that's tough, even for me. So none of us are exempt from that, but we need to seek what God wants us to do. And sometimes we know what God wants us to do. We just don't want to do what God wants us to do. Amen. A grudge is an unforgiving spirit that leads us to unforgiving attitudes and unforgiving actions. It is a deep, ongoing resentment that we cultivate in our hearts against someone else. Rather, we keep it alive. And we think, well, grudges, they're destructive. But grudges are destructive to us and others, not just to the others. It destroys marriages. It breaks up families and friendships. Grudges do because we can't let it go. Absolutely can't let it go. It even affects churches. Because grudges that Christians hold against one another can spread like cancer and damage the church. Same thing. You have a grudge against someone, what does the Bible say? Take it to them. Take it to them. Go tell them why you have. And then ask for their forgiveness because you forgive them for whatever they've done against you, right? But whether whether they forgive you or not, it's our goal to forgive them and get rid of the grudge. Leave it behind us. Many times a grudge we hold on to is not just destructive, but are also self-destructive. They affect us. They affect us very, very badly. And, and that's the thing. Sometimes the people we have grudges against, they don't even know it. We're all bitter and mad and angry and the whole deal, and they don't even know. So actually, the grudge is harming us, not them. And they really don't care. There are people that way. They really don't care. But we're allowing it to drag us down and bog us down. And when we hold a grudge against someone, we'll wind up hurting ourselves more, more than the person we're holding it against. It affects us in that way. So we should get rid of those grudges. Max Lucado makes this interesting comment in one of his books. Unforgiving servants always end up in prison. Prisons of anger, guilt, and depression. 
Holding a grudge, that's what it does to you. It puts you in that type of prison. God does not tell us. He doesn't tell us that we're going to ignore whatever a person's done to us. He doesn't tell us to ignore that. I can't find that anywhere. He isn't asking us to pretend that it didn't happen or pretend that it didn't matter. He's not asking us to do that. He's asking us to forgive it, get rid of it, leave it behind us, and let it go. That's what he's asking. But he does ask us to forgive the grievance. Forgive the grievance. Some of you may have walked in here with a grudge this morning and get somewhere. But the Bible is real clear. Put it behind you. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 14. Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So see, it harms us when we're unwilling to forgive. Because God's not going to forgive us until we figure that out. Third thing that we need to do, commit ourselves to rid ourselves of sin in our lives. Third thing, three simple things. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 11. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 11. It says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. You know, as we heard this morning with this gentleman, Keith, that was baptized, he has some things going on in his life, but he's ready to put it behind him. We all have something going on in our lives that needs to be put behind us. We need to get rid of sin in our lives. Are we going to have sin in our lives? Yes. As long as we're in the flesh here on earth, we will have sin in our lives. But the goal is to strive, as it says here, to get rid or be dead to sin. We have to strive at it. Nothing's easy. I mean, if it was easy, then everybody would be Christians. Amen? But it's not. We have to strive at it. We have to work at it. But first of all, all we have to identify it. And that sometimes is kind of tough, just identifying what that sin is. Many of us know, but we don't want to admit it. It is known that after the American Civil War was over and the slaves had been set free, many slaves decided to stay with their former master and continue to do what they were told. They were set free, but chose to live as a slave. The New Testament shares that is exactly how many Christians choose to live. In the same way, a slave to sin. Even though Jesus dying on the cross gave us power to overcome those sins, we can find ourselves still choosing to be a slave to sin. That's where your commitment comes in. That's where you're, you have to have those commitments to rid sin in your life. Jesus Christ, he died to set us free. And the Holy Spirit was giving us the power to be free. But many Christians still choose to obey the old master, which is sin itself. So maybe it's time. Maybe it's time today. Fresh start. January 2nd, 2022. Put it behind you. Lay it down. Get rid of those sins in your lives and move forward. When God says for us not to let sin control the way we live and not give in to lustful desires, he is issuing a challenge. He knows it's a struggle, right? So he's challenging us in a way to turn back from our transitions and our sins. You know, he could, he could snap his fingers and get rid of all the sin everywhere. We have free will and we have a choice. He knows what our sins are. He just wants to make sure we know what our sins are. Amen. 
So why not start fresh? Why not start fresh today in this new year and say, hey, I'm, I got a new lease on life here. I'm going to do some things a little bit different. You know, it took many, many years for you to become the person you are today. So don't expect that to change overnight. But the Bible's real clear, strive toward that change. One problem that Christians deal with is they have some kind of deep embedded sin in their lives that keeps them imprisoned. Think about that, deep embedded. Yet instead of confessing it and asking God to help remove it, they just learn to live with it. It's there. I've been this way my whole life. I, I, you know, I'm never going to change. That's not true. First of all, you've got to want to change. And second of all, you've got to allow God to help you change. Those are two things that work. You don't have to be the same way forever. Like I say, you didn't get there overnight. It took time to get to where you are today. And it'll take time to change those habits and those sins in your life. But we have to strive to do so. What happens is that people just keep giving in to the sin and allowing it to control their lives. And some people, they've gotten in that pattern. You know, they've gotten in a pattern where sin controls their lives and they just, they haven't figured it out yet. How, how do I get out of this? Well, there's only one answer. That's Jesus Christ. It's the only way. God's word challenges us to stop and turn away from all sin in our lives. To stop letting it control our lives. So do you have a sin in your life right now that you, you kind of just keep over here in a closet and, or here under a rug or somewhere that just pops up every once in a while? But it's still got control. Or do you have control? Today's the day to get control. And say, hey, I'm done with that. I'm going to make this change today. This is a fresh start. This is a new year. I'm going to do things a little bit different. The thing is, it's easy to say. Easy to say. It's tough to do. It's like a diet. It's easy to say I'm going to diet. But boy, when you see all that food. Temptation, right? Same thing's going to happen to you. When you make a commitment to cross the same thing, devil's going to come around with a chicken leg. Say, hey, you like fried chicken? Here it is. That's what's going to happen. He's going to tempt you. It's tough. It, you have to work at it. When Jesus died on the cross, though, he broke the power of sin right then. He gave us victory and the power to resist sin. Right then. He gave us the power to tell Satan to take that chicken leg. And, no, never mind. We won't go. <clears throat> God tells us we're no longer a slave to sin. We don't need to live like it or act like it. Amen? Amen. What a great thing. We don't have to be that way. A resolution is like a promise. So if you made a resolution... You basically made a promise. So maybe that's why some people just kind of rose their hand just a little bit up there. Didn't get it all the way up there. Because it's like a promise. And God has made many promises in the Bible to us. Many promises. And he's kept every promise. He's committed to us. One promise is that if we ask for God's forgiveness of our sins and his power to resist that sin, then we will see that this new year, this new year, 2022, can bring about a new era in our spiritual lives. It can change. It can bring joy and contentment like no other year you've ever experienced. If you go all in, get all in with your commitment to God, with that resolution, with that promise. It basically comes down to this. If we're willing to make these simple commitments, these simple commitments, commit to forget our failures, commit to give up our grudges, and commit to ridding sin in our lives, then we really have something to look forward to and celebrate this next year. That's something to celebrate right there. So why don't we start today by asking God for his strength to fulfill all of our resolutions that we might have made, our commitments for not only the new year, but for the future. Why aren't we just going to stop with one year? Why don't we ask God, help us, not just this year, but every year in the future. Our last commitment should be 
our commitment to the Lord. We should commit to make every effort to live a life with God, included in every aspect of it. Put God first. We need to be calling on him for strength and guidance in every decision and action we take. How many times do we just take action or we make a decision and God's not in the midst of it? God gives us what we call a discerning heart. When you commit to God or you're speaking to God about something and you have a discernment in your life, in your heart, that you feel maybe that's not the door that needs to open. Maybe that's not the direction you need to go. I always say if you push against a door and it doesn't open, you push against it again and it doesn't open, God's not opening it. Wait on God to swing that door wide open and say, come on. Make sure your decisions and your actions line up with what the Lord's expecting you to do. And if we're willing this morning to make these four simple commitments to the Lord, we will see a life change for this new year. Amen. Psalms 37 verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. That's a promise. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. We lift, lift this morning to you, Father. Father, we are thankful. We're thankful for your son that you sent to be born and then die, Father, on the cross for our sins. We're thankful, Father, for Christmas, that hearts change. People are touched, that it, is, it reveals you more than any other time throughout the year. We thank you for that. And Father, we do thank you for this new year. We thank you for this opportunity and this fresh start that we look forward to in this new year. We look for better things. Father, we intend to put that past behind us and strive forward to the goal, Father, of reaching you and your kingdom. So, Father, today be with us. Father, we thank you for the blessing and favor you show upon this church house and this church family. I pray that you would continue to bless each and every one, provide them safety as they leave here today. Father, that they might encourage others to make those same commitments. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give all the glory to you. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.